one of my favorite psalms. This is God's word. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babies and infants. You have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moons and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands and you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth.
Well, our call to confession uh, this morning, as we are in the Lenten season and we're wanting to use God's Word to prepare uh, to celebrate all that's to come uh, during Holy Week. So our word, our uh, call to confession, if I can get my act together here, comes from Psalm 24. This is God's Word. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. And then our prayer of confession will be on the screen and we'll be reading that uh, together. O God, most holy, whose Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, cast out from the temple those who desecrated the holy place. Forgive us our sins and cleanse your church from all falsehood and hypocrisy, from dissension and all uncharitableness, that we may be a house of prayer for all nations. Have a protection to the glory of your name. Amen. And then as we confess our sin uh, to the Lord, our assurance of pardon based on the shed blood of Jesus. This is God's word. Affliction will slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Amen and amen. Well, why don't we stand back up into our ship? And how deep the Father's love for us, and how vast beyond all measure. Oh 
song this morning that comes from the book of Isaiah chapter 53 verses 3 to 5 which says that he Jesus was despised and rejected by mankind a man of suffering and familiar with pain like one from whom people hide their faces he was despised and we held him in low esteem surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering yet we considered him punished by God stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. And the song is called Son of Suffering, and the lyrics of the song, it reminds us that Jesus' sacrifice was for our freedom and healing. His blood still speaks, and his love still reaches us. We can praise him for his mercy and grace. We can give glory to God forever for his son. So let's sing this together. Oh, the perfect son of God in all his innocence here walking in the dirt with you and me he knows what living is he's acquainted with our grief a man of sorrow son of suffering blood and tears how can it be there's a God who there's a God who pleads, and oh, praise the one who would reach for me. And hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. Some imagine that you are distant and removed. But you chase us down in merciful pursuit. To the sinner you were grace, and in the broken you embrace. And in the end is in, is in your wounds. Yes, in the end the proof is in your wounds. It's blood tears how can it be and there's a God who weeps and there's a God who bleeds and oh praise the one who would reach for me and hallelujah to the son of suffering Your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all praise, King Jesus. Glory to God forever, your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus, 
Glory to God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God forever, your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus, Glory to God in heaven, your blood is still speaking, your love is still reaching, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God forever, blood and tears, and how can it be, and there's a God who and there's a God who believes, and oh, praise the one and who would reach for me. And hallelujah to the son of suffering, and hallelujah to the son of suffering, oh, hallelujah to the son of suffering. suffering, Lord of heaven's armies, our Savior, our Master, our Father, our friend. I come before you this morning, Lord. We long for your spirit. We long for your presence. We celebrate you in our hearts for your sacrifice, for what you, all you have done for us, Lord. We ask you come, fill this place. Fill our hearts with your word connect our hearts and our minds so that we can better pour out of us what you pour in this morning into the world. We love you this morning, Jesus, so very much. Soften our hearts for this coming week. Let us celebrate, but know the cost that you bore, Lord. We praise you this morning, Jesus. We give you all the glory. Bless this word, and in Jesus' name we pray. Good word this morning as we sing from uh, Psalm uh, from Isaiah 53 and and uh, that captured in the chorus nothing but the blood of Jesus for our children um, four years through fifth grade they'll be heading up to children's church and and learning more of the saying being equipped and encouraged in that uh, truth we look forward to that and we uh, turn our attention to God's word uh, continuing in the Gospel of Matthew but. Uh, looking at chapter 21 this morning, uh, it begins with the triumphal entry of Jesus. That's what Palm Sunday is about, that triumphal entry. So we start with that and then 
uh, we, we pick up where Jesus comes to the temple. And this is the Word of God, beginning at verse 12. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Amen. So we've been in the Gospel of Matthew, we've been seeing that it has been building up to this confrontation between Jesus and the leaders in Jerusalem foreshadowing uh, Jesus' death. And Jesus here boldly confronts injustice as we have seen him do before. Uh, many Christians today, we're not familiar with uh, this uh, idea of, of, of boldly confronting injustice. In one way, uh, we're able to avoid persecution, uh, living in, in a society that is, is more permissive toward that, at least historically. Our days may be coming. There are many places in the world where there is, that is not so. Uh, but perhaps part of it is that we do little to challenge the sinful practices of our societies. And that's when the con confrontation happens. Jesus is bold about that. His entry into Jerusalem is kingly. His appearance in the temple is prophetic. Uh, Jeremiah 19 in particular talks about that. And so this is a bold act. And it's bold in part because the temple was guarded. There were fierce guards that looked out to make sure that there wasn't commotion in the temple. And yet here they seem to be hesitant, uh, reluctant to, to lack the courage or the motivation to stop Jesus from turning over uh, the money changers and, and disrupting everything going on in the court of the Gentiles. Why is Jesus so outraged? Well, first of all, this is a, a, a marketplace that was acceptable to have a marketplace as people came to offer sacrifices. They had to be able to get them. Uh, if you're coming from nearby, you could bring your sacrifice with you, but if you're coming from a foreign country, that's a long way to bring a lamb. And so you would purchase, and then it had to be unblemished. And so they would do that. But they had moved the marketplace into the courtyard of the Gentiles, into the place that was allowed indeed by God's design was the place that uh, the Gentiles could come, those who were not Jews could come to worship God, to be drawn. That's God's design. That's God's plan. God's intention was that salvation or redemption would come through the Jews, but it was never His intention that it would be only for the Jewish people, that it is for the nation. And it is for the peoples. And so the court of the Gentiles, he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer in verse 13. He's quoting from Isaiah 56, verse 7, where he says, my house shall be a house of prayer for all peoples, for the nations. And so Jesus uh, uh, comes into the enclosed Jerusalem sanctuary, the section that's supposed to be for the Gentiles, and he finds out that it's not very welcoming at all. Uh, this is God's plan of redemption. We see that in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 41 and following. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm, and when he comes and prays toward this house, here in your heaven, your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner at calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. 
But by the time of Jesus' day, even in contrast to how it was set up in the Old Testament, uh, there are now partitions and there are signs warning the Gentiles not to go past the court of the Gentiles, even upon pain of death. The ancient historian Josephus gives us those details about what had happened. That wasn't part of the prescribed uh, setting, but that's what has happened now, and perhaps it's concerned about um, uh, uh, religious purity. But the concern here is the sanctity of the outer court for the worship of the Gentiles. They can no longer worship there, and, and it's a sorry spectacle that greets Jesus' eyes, his ears, and even his nostrils as he comes into the temple. It's been desecrated. It's become a marketplace, and it's the, the business is booming. It's lucrative, and, and the Passover is, is, is near, so they're being swarmed with thousands upon thousands of people coming to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. Business is booming. There are many, many people there buying and selling. And so there is the noise and the filth and the stench of all the livestock, because that's what they do. Could this, in any sense, be called worship? And Jesus revealed himself as indeed being the Lord of the temple. Uh, in Matthew 12, verse 6, we saw he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He says, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And so he says here, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. That first part of the statement then is tied to Isaiah 56, verse 7. And it's clear that God designed the temple as a place where God would meet his people. And that it would be a sanctuary, that there would be quiet and there would be reverence. There would be a, a place for meditation and fellowship in the context of offering sacrifices unto the Lord. But it would be a, people, a place welcoming to people who did not yet know the living God. That was the intent. The second part of the statement, uh, Jesus makes comment here, and he contrasts this ideal for worship in Isaiah 56, that it, the house would be a house of prayer for the nations. And uh, he contrasts it, and he pulls in from Jeremiah chapter 7, where we uh, read Jeremiah saying, but you've, you've made the, the place a, a den of robbers. And the idea was this, that Somehow they had gotten the notion that it was okay and, and there was stealing, there was blasphemy, there was murder, there was all things going on in daily life. But then when they came into the temple, it was like all that just goes away. And it's kind of covered, God averts his wrath because we've come to the temple and then, and then we can go back out and do it again for another week. And Jeremiah says that's not how it works that coming to the temple, that merely the formalities of worship do not protect you from God's just judgment of sin. It would be like this. Perhaps we, we get a sense uh, as, as Americans that God has a special favor for us, and we can even get a little arrogant about that because our motto, it's, it's on our coins, is what? In God we trust. Surely God must be happy with us because our quarters say, in God we trust. It doesn't matter what we do, how we treat each other, how we uh, treat God, how we treat babies, how we treat... It doesn't matter as long as we, in God we trust. But God doesn't see it that way. There's not a magic talisman that we can pull out that just covers us. Uh, we just finished singing that it's nothing but the blood of Jesus that accomplishes our atonement. And so Jesus is warning here of the same thing, that we can't live in rebellion to God's will, come and worship, and it just makes it okay. And so history is kind of repeating itself in Jesus' earthly ministry. And I want to read those words from Jeremiah 7. 
from which Jesus quotes here. Jeremiah said, Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. He says it three times. In other words, by that repetition and by, hey, we are in the temple of the Lord, now we're okay again just by being there. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal and go after other gods that you have not known and then come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say, we're delivered only to go on doing all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? And so you can see that connection Jesus is making. And as he overturns the money changers, it's specifically mentioned that he knocks over the benches where the people who sold the pigeons sat. The pigeons were the offering that the poor made. That was the smallest offering, but it was important and it counted. And so the poor couldn't even worship with all that's going on. Jesus cares from first to last. And having confronted the indifference uh, toward those who desire to worship God in spirit and truth by declaring that his house must become a house of prayer, Jesus setting forth something he's going to make explicit after the resurrection. We'll read about it when we get to the 28th chapter of, of, of Matthew. We'll read the Great Commission. And there in the Great Commission, Jesus says we're to go into all the world and take the gospel that people throughout the world would know Jesus for who he is and what he has done. That's what the gospel is all about. That has always been God's intent. And so he says that his house must be a house of prayer, a place for prayer. And if the church is to be a place for prayer, what does it say then about the people? What does it say about us? What kind of people are we to be? A people of prayer. That's the call. That's the intention. Not just there be a building where you can pray, but that we would be a people committed to pray and make prayer a priority. That's one of the emphases each year in Abide 21 as we participate with like-minded churches in that emphasis on prayer and fasting It is setting forth again the priority of prayer amongst the people of God. We make it a priority. Some of the blessings I see is when we've gathered for worship um, and, and, and seeing people praying for one another. Not in the context of when we've gathered for worship, but just after worship. Someone shared a need or a concern or a a joy, and there is prayer being offered. As I came through uh, where Iglesia in Movimiento meet. Uh, I saw two men in prayer together as, as I just was passing through. That's a delightful thing. We're a house of prayer. It is always appropriate to stop and pray. If someone's sharing a need, say, can we pray about it? Not not sometime during the week. Do that too, but pray. Stop and pray. When, when uh, every month uh, between services, there is a prayer gathering that Jeff Sin uh, uh, oversees. There's a particular emphasis of prayer. And they meet in the choir room over in the Christian Ed building. I long for the day when they won't fit in the choir room, that we need more space as we become a house of prayer. It, it is a delight in grace ministry as food is shared on grace ministry, uh, food distribution days, to also see people praying for and with the people that we we serve and have needs and some have heavy burdens in life and to see prayer taking place out of the car or uh, on the grounds we're to be a people of prayer uh, we we gather every other uh, uh, month right now to in the sanctuary when we pray for righteousness and goodness uh, to prevail for evil to be thwarted in our own community where it's happening And so we engage in prayer. That's the idea that it would be a a priority. Jesus isn't saying that he's throwing them out because in order to pray, you have to have a perfect environment. There needs to be total silence and uh, the light's just right and everything for prayer to take place. That's not how it's working. That's not what he's saying at all. What he's saying is that when prayer, when it's nearly impossible for it to take place because of all the commotion, that's not good. Or if prayer isn't a priority, 
That's not good. Something's going to miss. Jesus says this is to be a house of prayer. After the disturbance dies down in the temple, the priests look, and they see a group of, verse 14 says, the blind and the lame are surrounding Jesus. Well, Jesus is making himself known, and, and what's happening here is as a holy week, as, as the cross looms before just days ahead, Jesus is making clear that he is the prophet and the priest and the king who was to come and who has come. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was what was declared, and now the children are saying uh, the same thing. But the, 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 the gathering here is of the, the, the blind and the lame. Don't miss the distinction that Matthew makes here. While some are being expelled by Jesus, others are being welcomed by Jesus. Jesus is unchanging. He is still the good shepherd. He still ministers in that way. From holy indignation to tender compassion in just moments. And Jesus healed them. None of those who came went away disappointed. But you see the picture. He's standing in the midst of overturned tables and scattered coins and knocked down benches and animals that are still scrambling and bleeding and whatever, bleating, not bleeding, bleating uh, as, as it's craziness. And there Jesus is praying for the blind and the lame as a place for them. And what was particularly distracting and off-putting to the scribes and chief priests were that there was a question mark whether the blind and the lame should even be there because it represented something that wasn't quite right and put together. There was not officially, but a, a sense in which, you know, get yourself together before you come to the temple of the Lord. That's completely contrary to what Jesus teaches if we wait until we can put ourselves together, we'll never come. That indeed, that the call is to those who are broken, who are hurting. Uh, as Celebrate Recovery says that we all have hurts and hang-ups and, and habits. That applies to every single one. We come with them and we meet the Savior who is gracious to us, who is tender and compassionate to us, who heals and redeems and restores we're also reminded in this that we are to make sure there is a, a, a way and, and a place for those with disabilities to feel welcome, to worship the Lord along with us. They're welcome. The priests and the scribes uh, see the wonders. And they hear the children shouting the hosannas to the son of David. And their response, verse 15, is to become indignant. They're quite angry about, about it, and, 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 and this just uh, adds fuel to the, to the fire of we have got to do something about the Jesus problem. And by the end of the week, they will. He will be on the cross. What irked them is this combination, the cleansing of the temple, the miracles for the blind and the, and the lame, and then... The audacity of these children to just be hollering out, Hosanna to the son of David. Wasn't this blasphemy? Didn't Jesus recognize it was blasphemy and right there in the temple? Again, an amazing thing, and it's human nature, we deal with it too, is they could see what they thought was blasphemy. It actually wasn't blasphemy because Jesus indeed is the son of David, the king of whom that was worthy. But they could see, and they were concerned about blasphemy in the temple. Who are these people? The ones who allowed the temple to be desecrated. The ones not only allowed it, it seems they encouraged it. With all the animals filling the court of the Gentiles that Jesus had just cleansed. They couldn't see that. And what about their own murderous 
thoughts and, and their own murderous designs in their heart. We've got to get rid of Jesus. There was blasphemy in the temple, but they were looking in the wrong place. They needed a mirror. And very often, as we're pointing out, we do need that mirror to look and, and, and ask, Lord, is it me? Is it me? First work in my life. They couldn't see it. And the bigger problem was that Jesus did see it and seemed to approve of it. How upside down. They were indignant. Do you hear what these are saying? Why were they saying this? Children are imitators. We, we know that. If you're a parent, you especially know that. You, you have seen them do things that you've done and you've smiled about it. And you've seen them do things that you have cringed because you know exactly where it came from. That's how it is. They, they learn by imitating. They, they do that. They're the little sponges that soak it up. And they had just been with parents shouting about Jesus, Hosanna to the son of David. And now they're in the temple. They're shouting Hosanna to the son of David. And they actually get it right. Their praises are right. And Hosanna means save now. It is, is a call. It's exaltation because he can. It's, he's kingly, but it's a cry. Save us now would now be the time of our redemption, our full redemption. Don't you hear what they're saying? And Jesus says, yes. And then he asks them a question. Have you never read? They had read. There are authorities about the Old Testament. Sometimes we can read something, and it gets here, and it doesn't seem to get here. And that's, that's what was going on. They had read it, but they hadn't heard it. Have you never read? And he quotes from Psalm 8. Well, we just heard Psalm 8. Read, read that as our call to worship. Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. From the mouths, from the lips of children, God has ordained praise. And a, a, a common thought structure, an argument would go uh, at, at that time was if the children get it, then surely us adults should get it. The religious leaders should have joined in as well. And Jesus tells them that, you know, sometimes the children speak the truth. We, we have an expression for that, right? What do we say? Out of the mouths of babes. Sometimes we, we hear that. Well, God has ordained praise as well. And the implication in all of this, in that God would ordain praise from children, that God would ordain praise even from nursing babes, the, the prattle that somehow in God's economy is music to his ears. It's praise to him. And we rejoice in that. Hosanna to the son of David. In a veiled manner, Jesus is affirming what he is going to openly declare in just a short time, in chapter 26, verse 63, we read, The high priest said to Jesus, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says, You have said so. The church is a place for prayer. And the people of God, we are to be a people of prayer to prioritize that uh, alone and uh, together. We are also, as a church, a place for children. That means we're a people for children. That we are about defending children in this day. Because that's what Jesus does and would have us do that we would defend children wherever there is harm threatened to children. 
we care about life from the womb. We care about what is happening to children, what they are learning, what they're being exposed to. We are to be defenders of children because God has called us to that. We're to be welcoming people, a welcoming church for families and for children. Because children, sometimes it'll be said about children, children are the church of tomorrow. Well, that's not quite true. They're the leaders for the church of tomorrow, but they're part of the church today. Nora Ray Vassarelli is on the rolls of First Presbyterian Church. She is a part of our church family. Our children matter to God. God doesn't say, you know, one day when you get old enough, then you can be part of the family of God. Thankfully, he doesn't say that. In fact, he calls us his children as adults. And so that is this idea here of being welcoming to children and seeing how Jesus recognized them. The book I'm reading is talking about uh, some of that. And, and, and they said this, raising up the next generation in the faith takes the whole church working and praying together to build something beautiful for the next generation. In other words, it's more than just about generating a worship service on Sunday mornings. It's much more than that. And it takes the church working together. Uh, a number of years ago, a, a politician came up with this idea about it takes a village and it was like, that's a whole new idea. It wasn't, it was a stolen idea. Jesus had said, the Bible teaches that it does take the, the family of God and we are together in it. That's why a promise was made when Nora was baptized. And do you, the congregation, uh, uh, agree to join with the family in, in supporting and encouraging and living for uh, and showing to their children in spirit and truth the living, gracious God, the Lord Jesus. And so we have this, and it's possible, the writers say, it'll take men and women embodying the fruit of the Spirit, determined to pray and to listen. It will take a community that makes it okay to not be okay because we're all works in progress, moving toward glory by the grace of Jesus. And then they talk about how it's important that we make sure our children receive regularly the gift of, of corporate worship, that they are a part of corporate worship. And that can be hard to do. Uh, it seems to me that Satan is often at his busiest on Sunday mornings, at least in families. There can be chaos that isn't happening any other day of the week, and then it happens on, on Sundays and things. Uh, it's hard for single parents. I, I, I get that because when we got here, we had a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a one-month-old. And I was no help on Sunday mornings. I wasn't there. And Clonell, get them ready, and they would be at church every week. We had our grand, two of our grandsons uh, last week staying with us, and Saturday night when she got ready to give them a bath, there was no water. We had a pump problem. We ran out and bought jugs of water and. I wasn't highly expectant that she would be there with the boys here at worship, but she was. A priority that they would be in worship and, and to raise that priority in, 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 in your lives, in the lives of our children and grandchildren, because if worship isn't a priority in our lives, it will be less a priority in our children's lives. And what does it say for our grandchildren? There is a priority, and we have a responsibility because Jesus said that we're a house of prayer, but we are also a house for children that honors the Lord when we do that. In the writings, there is an urgency in the words, and rightfully so, but there is also a hopefulness in what they write, and, and also rightfully so. Because the house of the Lord is still a place for prayer and a place for children. And may that increasingly be so for First Press. And may we encourage and applaud and assist 
young parents as they prioritize worship in their lives. We see uh, uh, someone and they've got to get one to the restroom and they got two more sitting on the chair. Hey, can I watch your kids for a little bit? I'll, I'll sit here with them. I can do that. Being mindful, making it a place where children are welcome and that they have instilled not just from their parents, but from the church body, that this is a place for them, that they will know and sing, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so, but I also saw it in my church family. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word and your call and your claim upon our lives and upon the lives of our children for their good and blessing and redemption and joy that their identity would be clear and they would know who they are and whose they are and that they are welcome. So help us to be a church of a people of prayer and a people who defend and welcome children. We value and celebrate children because Jesus did. We pray in his name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ray, again for bringing God's word uh, always full of encouragement, but always full of challenge as well. And uh, praise the Lord for his grace, because that's what empowers us uh, in all uh, of that. As we uh, pray together, just a few things to highlight. So Mike Bouyer, been in and out of the hospital, in and out of the hospital for years, and uh, he is home, and so that's uh, a big, big deal. Uh, one of our elders, Frank Bush, had shoulder surgery, say that three times fast, um, but uh, not only was he in worship for the first time after several weeks, but he was actually in the choir the earlier uh, service. Where is Sarah Gate Gillis? Is she here? Right here. This is her last Sunday for a while. So she is uh, actively pursuing whether God is calling her into full mission work with uh, YWAM Youth with a Mission. And so she is about to leave for another discipleship training like five months, five months. And then potentially at the end of that, go on another uh, short term mission trip. And so uh, we will miss you. Thank you for all that you do for our church. And she does media and website and all that kind of stuff. Um, And we will be praying for you, that God will use that training to help you know what his calling is uh, on on your life. And then um, just one personal thing. Many of you have been praying for my niece, Sydney, for a long time, and people ask me every once in a while how she's doing. Uh, miraculously well. Um, still some challenges. Um, if you want, sometime I'll show you a video of her snow skiing. Now down a bunny trail with lots of family, you know, hovering around. Um, But also when we were on vacation last week, I actually got to play pickleball with Sydney, and she was running around just incredibly miraculous. Still has a feeding feeding tube, which is not fun. Um, Pray, because they're talking about a potential another surgery uh, to fix that, and it's not for sure. Um, But pray pray for Sydney. Thank you for doing that. And then uh, two folks to ask that asked us to pray for them, Howie Coops. And Louise Tompkins both have medical procedures uh, this coming uh, week. So let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, we uh, thank you that your word says that Jesus intercedes on our behalf all day long. We're thankful that you are mindful of us, your people. We're thankful that you hear our, our prayers and you answer our prayers and Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, sometimes it's wait, sometimes it's silent, but you're always working in and through the prayers of your people. And so, Father, convince us anew that as we pray to you that you're our Father and you always have our best interests at heart. So when you answer our prayer, you're giving us what is best for us. Help us to trust in you. Father, we thank you for the things that that we have shared, the praises, and we give you all the the praise and the glory and adoration for those uh, things. We do pray for those that we've mentioned by name and others that we know who, who have medical procedures upcoming, those that are in the hospital that are, that are healing. Uh, Father, we have a number of folks in our church and those that we know that are battling uh, with cancer. Strengthen them, uh, heal them, uh, diminish the side effects of chemo and, and radiation. 
Father, we do pray for our own Sarah Gillis and how exciting it is for for her to be seeking full-time mission vocation. Father, we pray that this upcoming training, Father, that you would uh, teach her, uh, that you would use her, that you would grow her, help her to be a blessing to others, and, and really bring some clarity in terms of what your calling is on her life. Uh, Father, we thank you for Tom and, and Ann Hawks and, and Amelia Island, north of Jacksonville, uh, working to start a, a new church there. Father, we pray that you would continue to grow uh, that core group, bring the people they need to have the time and the spiritual gifts and the financial resources that they need to do the ministry you've called them to. Father, we pray especially that you would raise up somebody to lead music uh, in that young uh, congregation. Uh, Father, we do thank you for the ministry of Abide 21 and, and how it brings the churches together to pray together and to study your word together. We lift up specific, especially the, the prayer gathering tonight. Father, we pray that your people uh, would come and that they would be united and, and praying for revival for themselves and for the church and for the community and, and literally for our world. Father, that your Holy Spirit would come in power and uh, that you would hear uh, our prayers and that you would do uh, a mighty work. We pray for the upcoming Holy Week and just all the special services here at First Pres and our community and other churches in, in the community. Uh, Father, you would use all of that uh, to prepare us to really celebrate as we should uh, Resurrection Sunday and all that that means. Father, we thank you that because Jesus was raised uh, from the dead, uh, that it's confirmed that our sins have been forgiven, Father, and as he has been raised, we have been raised on a new life in Christ by your grace. Help us to live that new life. And lastly, Father, we thank you for your goodness and faithfulness to us as individuals, your goodness and faithfulness to us as a church. We thank you for how you provide for the ministries uh, here. Uh, Father, as, as funds are, are received on, on, a, on a weekly basis, Father, uh, by your grace, help us to be good stewards, help the leaders to be faithful, and that we would use um, all that you give us, time, spiritual gift, financial resources, all Um, for your glory, all to point other people to Jesus Christ. And we would give you all the praise. And all God's people said, amen. Well, please stand for our blessing. Uh, Again, as we often remind you, it's not just the the end of the service, but we send you out uh, with uh, God's uh, uh, blessing, which we all desperately need. I would ask you to stick around and stack uh, the chairs. Uh, That would be super helpful if you would like uh, prayer. Pastor Ray and I stay down front afterwards. If you've got to pray something good God's doing in your life, we'd love to celebrate that with you as well. Or if you have questions about the church or about the Christian faith or about Jesus, that would be a joy to discuss with you as well. This is uh, God's blessing from 2 Corinthians chapter 13. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen. Thanks for worship with us. Go in peace.